Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to CNBC's Path Forward, Your Money. I'm Tyler Matheson. With COVID-19 cases peaking once again, along with a historic recession, now more than ever, it is crucial to talk personal finance. And we've got a lineup of incredible speakers to help navigate the crisis and provide you with actionable strategies to get through these tough times and beyond. And to make sure you vote in our polls, please uh, check out the tab on the right-hand side of your screens and engage with your fellow uh, participants throughout the afternoon. We invite you also to join the uh, conversation throughout the day on social media using the hashtag CNBCYourMoney. You can follow us on Twitter, Twitter where we are at CNBC Events. We'd also like to thank our sponsors of today's events, Empower Retirement and Fully. You can learn more about them by clicking on the Expo icon on the left-hand side of your screen. And let's begin, meantime, with a few words from Ed Murphy, the president and CEO of Empower Retirement. Hello, I'm Ed Murphy, president and CEO of Empower Retirement, the second largest retirement services provider in the United States. Welcome. Thank you for joining this extraordinary event during such an extraordinary time. Before we get started, I want you to know that it's a privilege and a pleasure to speak with you today and help guide you through this ongoing period of economic uncertainty. We have several renowned leaders from the financial services industry scheduled to offer their own perspectives throughout today's engagement. I'm confident that you will gain the influential insight you need to make significant strides towards reaching your long-term goals. At Empower, we understand that a growing number of Americans are dealing with many unforeseen financial challenges, such as reduced income, job loss, and market volatility, just to name a few. But at Empower, we also understand that Americans are full of great resolve when it comes to managing their money and overcoming obstacles. We currently serve nearly 10 million individuals, providing them with personalized advice, resources, and strategies to help them achieve better outcomes. Despite the economic strain caused by the pandemic, we know how important it is for people to keep saving, investing, and preparing for their future. I encourage you to make the most of today's phenomenal opportunity to focus on your own financial goals. Where are you on your path toward reaching them? Even in these ever-changing times, with a well-thought-out plan, you can achieve your long-term investment objectives. Thank you, and enjoy the discussion. And thank you, Ed. Well, a crippled economy has turned the finances of many Americans upside down, but there are steps you can take right now to ensure financial stability in the short and long term. So please welcome the finance expert and best-selling author and my friend, Susie Orman, who will be interviewed by my colleague and also my friend, Sharon Epperson. She's NBC's senior personal finance correspondent. Sharon? Thanks, Tyler. You know, you may be trying to just keep your head above water, or maybe your finances are actually okay for now, and you just want to make sure it stays that way. No matter what you're facing in your financial life, Susie Orman can help you figure it all out. It is so good to have you with us, Susie. Thanks for being here. Anytime, my friend, anytime. I want to start by talking about the biggest financial asset most people have, and that's their career, their income. Millions of Americans have lost their job, or they may be afraid that they could lose it soon. How should your concerns about job security impact your financial decisions right now, whether it's retirement savings, refinancing, downsizing? What should be top of mind, Susie? You know, Sharon, for years, I've been known as somebody who gives advice that's kind of very simplistic. But the simplistic advice is what is going to get everybody through these times. And the advice is this. When your job is not secure, when times are changing, the goal of money is for you to be secure. And the main reason that you're going to be secure is very simple. Do you have an eight-month to one-year emergency fund to get you by if in case all of a sudden your income stops? 
Are you totally out of credit card debt? So in case you need something to be able to buy something when you don't have possibly any cash, you can put it on your credit cards. Are you doing the things that you need to do today to truly protect your tomorrows in case the unthinkable happens? And Sharon, if you think about it, the unthinkable did happen this past year. And so what are the lessons that we should have learned? And the main lessons is the most simple one of all. Do you have an eight month to one year emergency fund? Because if you don't, that is your number one priority, at least in my book. Yeah, you know, I mean, there are so many lessons that need to be learned. And most of us are going to be just so relieved when 2020 is over. But I'm always looking for that silver lining that that even in a financial pandemic, there are some lessons that we have to really take to heart. And you talked about emergency fund. And are there others in terms of what you should be doing with your debt or what you should be doing with your investments right now that really is a lesson that to be learned from this pandemic? Yeah, well, let's first talk about investments. When you think about it in reality, who has the money to invest? How are they investing? They normally are probably investing in their employer-sponsored retirement plan. Because really, do they have enough money to invest in their plan and their Roth IRA and have an investment account? Maybe some people do. But the majority <laughs> of people out there, really, the bulk of their money is in the retirement account. What we should have learned this past you know, year is that if you are investing, if you have 5, 10, 15 years or longer, when the markets retreat, they go down 38%, they go down 50%, rather than panicking and selling out and then just doing nothing, that just keep dollar cost averaging into these markets, which all of you or most of you are doing anyway, through your monthly contributions to your employer-sponsored retirement plans. Because we should have learned what goes down comes up. And on average, it takes about 3.1 years for in a bear market for it to go from the top to the bottom, back to the top again. Therefore, don't stop investing. Don't sell out. Don't get freaked and then liquidate everything. And then you missed it and you sold out at 38%. And now now here we are back at the top of the market again. Yeah, you know, it's fear, I think, that causes a lot of people to make some of these decisions and some of these mistakes that then they wish they hadn't made. And this crisis has shown a lot of us just how unexpected life can be, how things can change just in an instant. And whether it's a job loss, it's medical bills, it's something that's happened with your accounts, these feelings of fear or of shame or of anger are often preventing us from taking the actions that we need to get our financial life in order. And as you've said, this can impact your wealth, but it can also impact your health. You've had that experience recently. I've had that experience in the past. Tell us about this recent medical scare that you had, and, and we're so glad you've gotten better, but it also has helped you realize how important it is to double down on some of your own financial advice, Susie. Tell us a little bit about what happened. Yeah, you know, my advice has always been stand in the truth when it comes to your money. Open up those credit card bills. Tell everybody that you know how much debt you have. Make sure that you really face it to erase it. You've got to be in touch with your money. When it came to my health, however, it's things started to go wrong little by little, but I didn't, I didn't want to take the time to deal with it. I was on a book tour with my new book. I was doing this, I was doing that, and I wasn't paying attention to the things that were going wrong with me. And even when I started to notice that, oh, my right leg really wasn't working. Oh, I couldn't hold a fork anymore. I couldn't do things like that. I kept putting it off because then... Sharon, I got afraid of, oh, my God, I'm going to find something wrong with me, and I don't want to know that something's wrong with me. Same thing with yeah. your wealth. You don't want to know how little money that you have in a retirement account, or you don't want to know how much money you owe on your credit card, so you just don't open up your statements. I didn't open up my health statement, so to speak, so that I didn't go and check it out. I, you know, I went to places where anybody who told me anything that it wasn't serious, I believed them, to make a very long story short, it turned out that 
because KT begged me to do it. I went and got an MRI and they found a tumor on my spine that had crushed 80 to 90 percent oh of my spinal cord. So I was on the verge if I had a fender bender or if I had fallen or something, I would be a quadriplegic today. No doubt about it. And so within one day, they found the um, tumor. It was never cancerous. They found it. The next day, I'm in Boston at the Brigham Women's Hospital. Next day, I'm in a 12-hour surgery to remove it. Um, but everybody, oh it was a big deal. It was a big deal that yeah, I could have done something deal. about far before I did. So when it comes to your health, when it comes to your wealth, you can't just put it off. You have got to stay on it all the time. Yeah, you know, you, you had KT. You had a partner with you that was really helping you as well. And you also had some must-have documents, you say, that also helped during the procedure, during the process of getting the care that you needed. And now in this crisis, in this COVID crisis, these documents are more important than ever for people to have. Can you talk about what those key documents are that you had? Yeah, Sharon, how many times? And, you know, you and I go way back, girlfriend, way, way back. And the story Absolutely. has never changed. Absolutely. The four must-have documents that I call them, you need a will, you need a trust, you need an advanced directive and durable power of attorney for health care. In advance of you getting sick, you have to leave directions to your doctor as to who's to make decisions for you. Who does all these things? Do you want to be on life support? Do you not? And, but you need a living revocable trust, especially a really good one that has an incapacity clause in it, because a trust is the most efficient way for, number one, for you to leave your assets to avoid probate, which is a very cost-ineffective way to do it, and you're going to go through probate if all you have is a will. But you also need documents that say, if you can't make financial decisions for you, yourself, who's going to pay your bills for you? Who's going to write your checks for you? So a living revocable trust with an incapacity clause is absolutely essential. And those documents, if you went to see a lawyer, are about $2,500. But it's no secret, and I don't mind saying this, and I've said it over and over again, to make sure that America was protected years ago. I created a set with the lawyers of must-have documents that are $2,500 that you can get these documents and easily get them on my website at a price under, way under $100, and you can share it with all your family members. It's something every single one of you should absolutely look into. Everybody should be looking into this. And I know those documents saved my financial life when I had my health scare. So I absolutely agree with you. But when you talk about these issues, you know, even though we're in the midst of a crisis, or maybe even more so because we are, people don't want to think about it. They want to stay positive. They don't want to get discouraged. They don't want to think about the what ifs. But how do you stay positive and encouraged when there's so many uncertainties right now? What should people be doing with their finances to stay encouraged? Yeah, it's, you know, you really have to be a warrior, not turn your back on this battlefield right now. We are living in incredibly uncertain times. However, that does not mean that you become paralyzed with fear and you do nothing. Every single one of you is so strong. And really, there isn't an excuse large enough to keep any of you from being who you are meant to be. When you face it, when you deal with your credit card debt, when you deal with what are you doing with money, what are you doing with the lack of money, but you take action about it and you talk about it and you talk about your health and you go to check it out or whatever it may be, you feel stronger. And when you feel stronger, you have more power. When you have more power, you have more energy to turn on your financial lights, so to speak. So you have to plug into your power source. And you have to have faith that everything happens for the best. And you just can't give up. You can't just say, oh, well. You know, the main thing I would tell you is that your power, you know, that your thoughts, that your words have more power than you have any idea. They have the power to create or the power to destroy. So be very careful of the words that you use and the thoughts that you think. If you say you never will, you won't. If you really remain positive yeah. and just go for it, eventually all of this will turn around.
Yes, Susie. You know, uh, the power that the power that you have, the power source that you are, is what has excited so many people. We got a lot of people writing into us and sending videos in, excited that you're going to be here, and they had some specific questions. They wanted to make sure that they sent to you and that you were able to answer. And we wanted to share one with you from Joseph. He had a question for you. Let's listen. Hi, my name is Joseph from Columbus, Georgia. And my question is, Susie, back in July, you suggested stockpiling cash by only making minimum credit card payments, among other things. Do you still suggest that today? Yeah. Susie, what do you say? So, so Joseph, here's the thing. Remember, back in July, back in May, April, we had a government at that time that was giving you stimulus checks, that was giving you unemployment, that was giving you an extra $600 a week of unemployment. You also had the ability back then to postpone your mortgage payments, your student loan payments, all kinds of payments. So given that you didn't have to make any of these payments and you had money coming in from unemployment or from wherever it may have been, I wanted you to stockpile the cash then because I knew that this was going to go on for a long period of time. And once they stopped unemployment and the stimulus checks and you then couldn't go on forbearance on student loans or anything, what were you going to do? So, so now, however, we're in a whole different situation. Now, hopefully, you listened to me. You stockpiled that cash. Hopefully, you did put everything on your credit cards and you're paying the minimum payment due. And now, if you still don't have any money coming in, now you have a pile of cash to be able to pay your must bills that you have to pay. If you don't have that cash, then yeah, still put things on your credit cards, pay the minimum payment due, and save as much cash as you possibly can until you have a job where money is coming in. Yeah, Susie, let me ask you about this moratorium that's ending, particularly on student loans, on federal student loan debt. Come January 1st, as of right now, those payments are going to start again. What should people be planning to do or thinking about doing now with their student loan debt so they're ready for January 1? So it will depend, Sharon. Do they have their job back yet? Did they save all that money all of that time when they had their stimulus checks and unemployment checks coming in or whatever it may be so they could make those payments? It is possible that now, if they've been on the standard repayment method, which is where you pay your student loans over a 10-year period of time, and it really is the most cost-effective way to do it, maybe they're going to have to go on forbearance or on the income-based repayment programs, which are not my favorite because of how they work in the end, but they may need to adjust and work with their lender in terms of their repayment schedule. Also, they should absolutely be looking at, because interest rates now with student loans have gone down so much, they might want to look at now of possibly refinancing their student loans if they can to a low interest rate. They could get 2 or 3%, and a lot of these loans are at 6.8%, 7.1%. They might want to mm -hmm. look into refinancing their loans as well. That's great advice, Susie. You know, another person had a question for you. This is from Jen in Albany, and she wanted to ask you something, going back to the basics. Hi, my name's Jen Steverson, and I'm from Albany, New York. My question is, when maintaining a budget, what is your best tip to not get too stressed out? <laughs> we don't want to be stressed, so, Susie. What should we do? We don't want to be stressed. So here's what I want to tell you. I hate budgets. Budgets are like diets. You know, you go on this diet and you lose 20 pounds and you're feeling so great and then you gain 40. Same thing with the budget. When you restrict anything, you restrict everything and you'll save money and all of a sudden you'll get so frustrated. You'll go out and buy a new handbag, a new pair of shoes, and you'll be in more credit card debt. It's really about not budgeting. It's about controlling what you spend your money on. Here's what I would tell you. You need to simply live below your means, but within your needs. Just because you can afford something doesn't mean you should buy it. 
below your means within your needs. How do you do that? Just, Jen, for the next six months, just try this. Every time you're about to buy something, just ask yourself the question, is this a need or is this a want? If it's a need, you have to buy it. If it's a want, walk away. You watch how much money you save. Yeah, you know, I, I make myself look at an alert on my phone. If it's over $100, my bank automatically tells me, wait a minute, you got something over $100. Makes me think, do I really need this? Do I really want this or need this right now? And it's a way to keep me in check. But like you said, not necessarily restricting me, but just alerting me to what I'm spending my money on. It's a really good point, Susie. You know, I want to get to one more question yeah. from Elizabeth in Boston. Here's her question. Hi, my name's Elizabeth, and I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. My question is, what do you suggest for single women to help build a more secure financial future? <laughs> what do you say, Susie? Stay single. <laughs> but, but very seriously, you're very powerful when you live by yourself. You don't have to depend on anybody else. You don't have to balance anybody else and what they're doing. You have what it takes. So get strong with your money. Have your emergency fund. Have credit cards that don't have any balances on it. Start your own retirement account. Start learning about money. Seriously, watch CNBC. Watch all these shows. Learn how money works. Learn exchange-traded funds. Learn about all the great discount brokerage firms now that you can open up an account with and buy slices and fractions of stock and for no commission. This world really can be your oyster, but you have to be willing to take one step towards your money and stay control in control of it. If you meet somebody, this is the most important advice I could give you. You better make sure that the person that you may marry one day is a true financial match to you, that they don't have debt, that they respect money, that they don't spend it frivolously, that you have the same financial values. Because if you don't, all the hard work that you put together now as a single woman will go absolutely down the drain if you marry a financial loser. So stay a winner in every aspect of your life, girlfriend, every aspect, whether you're single or married. Susie, I got to follow up with the question for the couples out there who are like realizing in the middle of this pandemic, they may not be with their financial match. What are they supposed to do right now? If you're really not with your financial match, then you also know that you're not happy in that relationship. You know it. And if it doesn't change and you can't have that financial conversation, you're not going to like the answer to this question, but you have to stand in your truth and you have to ask yourself this one really important question. If you can turn back the hands of time, would you marry this person again? If the answer to that question is no, you have to take the steps to do something to protect your life really your life because your money and you that is your life just like your health and you that is your life your money and you is your life as well in a certain aspect if you would marry that person again then you really have to really work on it so that you are a financial match because if you aren't it is going to end up in divorce since arguments over money is the number one reason for divorce today be careful everybody be careful Really important, really good advice. And the last thing I want to ask you, Susie, is your best takeaway for 2020. The one thing we haven't talked about, and I don't know if this is the biggest issue, is what to do with your home, refinancing, with your rent, all of that. People's housing situation has changed so much, and there's so much concern over that. What is your advice there? Here's the thing. This is the perfect time to refinance. You can get a 15-year mortgage, which is a half a percent less than a 30-year mortgage to begin with. But if you refinance, do not make the mistake that you refinance for a longer period than is currently left on your mortgage. So you had a 30-year mortgage. You've been paying it for five years. You have 25 years left. Do not refinance for 30 years again. Refinance for 20 years. Knock some years off of that mortgage. Also, don't rush to be poor. 
If you don't have the money, if you don't have 20% to put down, if you don't have eight months to a year emergency fund besides your down payment, if your job isn't secure, don't go out and buy a piece of real estate just because interest rates are so low right now. Interest rates aren't going anywhere. The prices of homes have actually skyrocketed, which is a total surprise to me. I'm not exactly sure why they have, but they have. Just go slowly. Remember, there's nothing wrong with renting. Until you know that your job is secure, until you know that you're going to be living where you are right now because you have a job there, don't rush to go buy a home. And if you're having trouble meeting your mortgage payments and everything, there's nothing wrong with selling your home right now that, in, that you know, interest rates are low and prices are so high and downsize downsize if you can. The more money you can save today, the better tomorrow you will experience, financially speaking. Susie, such great advice on so many different topics, but I think the bottom line for 2020, for me, from this conversation that I've had with you, is to stand in my truth. Whether that is that I need to save more for emergencies, whether that's I need to deal with my credit card debt, I should be refinancing or downsizing, I should be dealing with student loan debt, whatever your truth is, you need to stand in it and deal with it, face it. And you will be stronger in 2021 for doing so, Susie. Thank you so much for your advice and for being here with us today for the Path Forward Your Money. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Sharon. The best financial advice I ever got was from my mom. I must have been like five years old and she took me to a bank and I got my first savings uh, book because back then, every time you put a deposit into the bank, it would sort of stamp your book and it would show how much you would save. And my mom always said, even if you can only put five cents into your savings account, or maybe 75 cents one day or 10 cents uh, another week, that it adds up and it starts to accumulate. And before you know it, you'll have more money in there than you ever dreamed of. Good advice from Dan and some great advice from Susie. I'm still laughing over Susie Orman saying, don't marry a financial loser. That is the best advice of all time, I think. You heard from Susie advises to save. And uh, our next guest, though, has a slightly different outlook on what to do with your money. Very interesting. I sat down with Bill Perkins. He's the CEO of Skylar Energy and the author of Die with Zero. Perkins says most people tend to oversave and underlive. So what does that mean? And how can you avoid doing it? Take a listen. What I found by looking at the data is that people's net worth uh, continues to climb from 60, 65, 70, 75, 80 on, on average. And so the purpose of savings is one, to uh, provide for our survival when we're no longer working or no, no longer receiving income, but also for delayed gratification, for some event, some choice, some experience, some memory. And it, and the data shows that many people, those who save, they save too much because they're never converting their hard-earned uh, life energy, the hours they worked, into whatever it is that they wanted, whatever experiences that they wanted. It just seems to be a number that keeps growing until they die. And so they, they are technically wasting their lives. But you know what people will say, and you hear it all the time, my biggest fear as a retiree is that I'm going to outlive my money and I'm going to have nothing left and I'm going to be a burden to my children. So how do you get people to to surmount that very natural uh, way of thinking? Well, I, I, I think that's a very healthy fear to have. Like we, we all want to survive and we don't want to be a burden on our children or society. But we need to look at what are the experiences and, and things we're going to do um, and, the, and what we think we're going to do. Um, and we can look at that with a financial planner and really look at the data. Like the more you look at the data, the more you realize that people are saving too much, even with rising health care costs, their net worth keeps going up and up and up. And so that's something that's been ingrained in people for quite some time. 
And what I um, tell people to do is to get off autopilot and really think about what their expenditures are, what they'll be able to do as they age and what they'll want to do as they age, and then match that to their savings, to what they're saving for. I can't help but, but think that you must be talking about a pretty narrow strata of the economy because there are an awful lot of people who have virtually no savings at all. They don't, they don't have it in their 401ks. They don't have it in their, in their banks or mutual funds. And, and, and the average net worth uh, for, I think, all Americans is something like 175000 And for African Americans, it's something like $19,000. So are you talking I, I, really specifically to people in an upper strata or everybody? No, I'm, I'm talking to everyone of all, of all um, wealth levels. For every hour that you exchange of your life uh, for money, right, that money is for a purpose. It's not a video game. You're not playing Space Invaders. You're not trying to get high score. You're trying to have certain events in your life. The first event is survival. We all want to survive, food, water, shelter. But after that, it's our choices. It's our own wants and desires. So whether you left over with $5 or $5 million, you can see that, hey, we've, over, we've oversaved $5. And when you look at the net worth keeps growing, whether $170,000 or $200,000, and I don't have the exact number in front of me, that money that you die with represents hours and years or maybe we weeks of your life, right, depending on, on your earnings power, um, that you gave up in, in exchange for money. And that money was meant for things, experiences, loved ones. And so it's not just the super wealthy. It's everyone about modeling their life from where they are now to the grave so they can maximize their enjoyment and their fulfillment. But I come back to the idea that, that, that the data show that the typical American household doesn't even have $1,000 on hand to get them through a tight spot. A lot of the data, so a lot of the data when you look at the tight spot or a lot of people don't have savings, there's a lot of people who have high pensions. Let's say you were a firefighter in California and you worked there for 20 years and you have $1,000 in, in the bank, but you have a $100,000 pension. That's an ideal situation, right? They're not oversaving and they have enough income to support themselves. So the data on savings and purchasing power and ability to survive is slightly skewed. And even when we're talking, yes, there are people who are, haven't solved for survival. That is the first thing we need to survive, uh, save for. And if you haven't um, saved for survival, the book is about modeling. It's not really about spending all your money and lighting money on fire. It's about modeling your life on where you are to see if you're undersaving or oversaving so that you get the maximum fulfillment. You know, life is like uh, yeah. Tetris. I <laughs> if you don't get the order right, and you don't get your spending right, you don't get the high score. And so some people yeah. are undersaving. I mean, I've, I've been there. Yeah. Intuitively, I, I, I want to agree with you because I think we often play it too conscious. And, and you don't know how much time you have on this planet. And you should not postpone your joy. At the same time, when you do go and take the two-week cruise in, in the Mediterranean or whatever it is, you're going, well, there's $60,000 that I'm not going to have if I really need it uh, down the road. And some people would say, hey, Bill, you know, you've done fabulously well in your life. It's easy for you to say all this stuff, but I don't have the luxury of wealth like you've been able to accumulate. Yeah, it, it's, it's not about, you know, what level your wealth. It's about getting the maximum you can out about whatever you have, whatever resources you have, whatever level of wealth, time and health you have. Right. And you're going to have varying degrees of that at different stages in your life. And I'm talking about modeling your life so that you convert properly your money into experiences at the right time frame so that you maximize it. Right. And so, yes, will I be able to uh, spend a lot more money uh, along along the way? Yes, that's true. But the, the curve and the slope of that spending in order to maximize whatever resources you have is going to be the same for people of equal health, of equal biological age, of equal deterioration, right? We're all going to deteriorate and we're all going to die. And as we deteriorate, the, the list of experiences that we can do or enjoy to do will change and it actually goes down. And so therefore, some of the money that you're saving now for this big trip, say, on, the, on your cruise 
Perhaps at a later date, you won't be able to do that. You won't need $60,000 10 years from now because your ability to enjoy that $60,000 on that cruise is obviated, either because of health or temperament. And so mm -hmm. there's an allocation of where your spending goes. And the data is very clear as as you get older, you spend less. And the reason is health and temperament. Yeah. I want to get to estate planning, which is a very and gifting to uh, the younger generation, which is a very interesting part of the book. Die with zero. All right. So take me through the planning process briefly that will enable me to die with zero or close to it and not way below zero so that I've got 10,000 left in the bank or whatever is a reasonable cushion, but I'm not in the hole by 200,000. Well, yeah. So one of the things we talk, we talk about in the book is that people try to be their own insurance agent. A lot of people just keep working and working and working. They feel that if I have X dollars and it always keeps growing, I can insure against this calamity, that calamity, and, and so on. And what I tell people is you're not a great insurance agent. There are products out there for when people die too early, right? Um, and, and, and their family would need money. And that's called life insurance. Everybody's familiar with that. And there's another insurance product out there called an annuity, which covers longevity risk, whether you live too long and you're going to outlive your money. And these are products that can ensure that if you're very worried about you're living to 100 and you don't have a dollar, you can buy an annuity that'll pay you for uh, on and on and on as long as you're living. Now, I'm not here to sell you insurance products, but my point is, is that acting as your own insurance agent is inefficient. And by doing that, you're wasting hours of your life going into a field that you don't have expertise on to have a client of one. Mm -hmm. Going back to estate planning. What? Go ahead. Yeah. Let's, so, let's, let's go to estate planning because one yeah. of the arguments you make, and, I, and it's, it's persuasive on its face, is that people wait to, to, uh, until their death to make a bequest. And by that time, the, the children receiving their bequest uh, may have wealth of their own and that it makes more sense to make large gifts through trusts or, or in other ways to give what wealth you have accumulated to that younger generation at a time when it really might make a difference for them to put a down payment on a house or to uh, uh, fund some schooling or whatever. Yeah, you're, make, you're, you're, you're making my points for me there. Um, what happens is, is that we all deteriorate and we all die, right? And so our ability to convert money into experiences, into enjoyment, deteriorates as our bodies deteriorate. And then ultimately we die and we can never, it's gone forever. And so if we're trying to make our children's lives better or our loved ones better, right? We want to give them the money when it has the maximum impact on their life, when they're most able to convert the money into positive life experiences. And that's not generally, that's not when you die, right? If you live to 80, 86 and your children are, are, are now in their 60s, okay, that is not the optimal point at which they will be able to convert money into experiences. Most people mentally mature around 28 and they physically mature around 33. And then they're in decline in both fields, plateau or decline. And so what I emphasize is that let's be deliberate with our planning. The kids don't have to have control of the money um, when you give it to them now. They can be put into a trust, and then at a certain date, it turns over to them for their lives. But giving money at a random date in the future when you're going to die to random people, because let's face it, we don't know if all our heirs are going to survive, right? And a random amount that you haven't deliberately planned, that's not really, that's not really caring for your kids. That's just kind of leaving things to chance. And so I, I advise people to get off autopilot, think about the amount they want to give, right? And if you don't have it all now, you can make pay, payments into a plan, get it out of your estate into their estate, right? So that if anything happens to you, their money isn't at risk because this is money that you choose to leave for your kids and that give it to them at an optimal time. You know, everybody says, you know, it's all about timing, right? Life is about timing. And right. so- we are trying to time our gifts so that has the maximum impact. So two final questions. Uh, I guess th th there would be one argument to, uh, as a counter argument there. If I make my gift at age 55, it is of one size. If I waited to make that gift until age 75, it's going to be bigger because there's going to be accumulation 
that presumably is going to take place over those 20 years. That's number one. And number two is, in many cases, um, the, the older generation doesn't want to, you, you, Matt, you touched on it, give control of the money to, for example, a spendth spendthrift child. Well, let me address number one. Um, at a certain point, let's just use extremes. Giving a gift to your children at 90, the ability to use that money or the value to them is, is going to be closer to zero. On their deathbed, it's, it's virtually zero. Even though they're alive, they cannot convert it into positive life experiences, right? And so as their bodies deteriorate, right, even though the number may be bigger, the utility to your children is lower, right? And that's going to depend on their biological age, their rate of deterioration, and their abilities, et cetera, and, and, and what they want. But by and large, on average, um, giving a gift at a younger, healthier age allows them to convert that money into experiences and happiness and joy or whatever it is that they want, right? Mm -hmm. Giving it to them on the day before they die does nothing, right? And so in between, there's a slope. And the peak ability to enjoy your money, to convert it into experiences, is going to be around 33. And from there, from there on, it declines. And so... Yes, there will be some children who are not mentally mature enough to handle the money at a certain age. Uh, some who will be more mature earlier, uh, not as mature at, at, at 40. But at some point, we have to relinquish control, and it's their ride and their life. And if, you're, you're, if your goal is to help them live their life and enjoy their ride, then you have to, you have to release the money to them at some point. And... I'm just talking about in general on the averages and the, the thematic, like the mental model that, hey, this person that I love is like a flower. They're going to bloom, they're going to deteriorate, and they're going to die. When is the best time to, to nourish them, to give them opportunities? And I say that it's between 28 and 33. Bill Perkins, it's been a joy talking with you. Uh, I haven't heard the word deteriorate so often in a conversation. It's kind of <laughs> Sorry, it sounds again. okay. A little... <laughs> that, that's okay. But anyhow, the book is Die With Zero. Bill Perkins, thanks very much. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Best financial advice I ever got? Number one, don't use credit cards. Number two, spend less than you make. Number three, invest in understanding finance. If you don't understand finance, it's awful hard to know what you're doing. Good luck, everybody. Some words of wisdom there from a guy who knows a bit about money, Mark Cuban. We'll share the best financial advice you've gotten over in the chat on the right-hand side of the screen. If you've got questions for our speakers, post them in the chat on the right. I've seen a lot of activity over there, uh, and I'm guessing you'll have a few for our next guests. They make their living on the gridiron and apply many of the lessons they've learned on the field to their finances. They're even teaching their teammates a thing or two about managing their money. Joining us now is Brandon Copeland of the NFL's New England Patriots who moonlights as a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and Carl Nassib of the Las Vegas Raiders, along with my colleague Dom Chu, CNBC's senior markets correspondent. Dom, the floor is yours. All right, so Tyler, it's great hearing Mark Cuban talking about understanding finances, and these are two great people because they both have teaching experience with regard to teaching some of their fellow players and even students. Brandon Copeland teaches formally at the University of Pennsylvania, as you mentioned, but Carl Nassib got a lot of notoriety a couple of years ago on HBO's Hard Knocks program, showing his teaching ability to teaching some of those finance basics to his teammates there. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. Maybe, Brandon, we'll start with the professional side of things on the University of Pennsylvania front. What exactly is it like and how important is it for folks to understand the basics of finance? Yeah, first and foremost, thank you guys for having me, Dom, Carl. It's great to see you both. Hope all is, is well mm -hmm. with you um, and you guys are staying safe. It, it's I think it's so, so important, and I think it's one of the reasons why I ended up 
taking the time in the off season to physically go and, and teach the course is because we all have different goals. And I think, well, even backing up a bit as a child, we're taught in society puts pressure on us to go to school, get good grades so that you can eventually get a, a good job. And then the, a lot of the route for that good job is so that you can have money. And um, unfortunately throughout that education, uh, we're not being taught how to utilize the money that we're working our entire lives for uh, in the right ways. So it, it's very important, simply put, to, to understand your money. And it's not that you're always going to make the right decision or the perfect decision. It's not that you're going to look back and think, oh, you know, um, I couldn't I could have done this a little bit better. It just means that you'll be able to fi be faced with some of these major life decisions and you'll be more confident in the decision that you're ultimately making. Now, Carl, what's interesting to me, to, to kind of dovetail off what Brandon said about the, the, the importance of knowing about personal finances, you come from a family of many, multiple professional athletes, folks who you've seen kind of go through their personal finances. How exactly are athletes treating their personal finances differently than, say, the rest of us out there who aren't on the football field every other week? A um, few points. Um, I think that athletes are just like any other Americans. Uh, American culture is, to me, we make money to spend money. Um, if you read the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, Daniel Kahneman um, really puts it in a layman's terms. When you get a lot of money, um, you think everything's okay. So your decision making goes a little emotional, uh, goes a little uh, intuitive and you don't really make the best decisions. And you see that with lottery winners. Um, you see with a lot of, indi a lot of individuals who um, come into money very quickly. Um, myself, um, I like to think I've made, a, uh, made good decisions over the past five years being in the NFL. I've made some mistakes. Um, but what Brandon was saying about educating, um, if, some, if somebody doesn't know or understand what it is, they're gonna be very wary of it. Um, and that goes true with anything in life. It's just you get more exposure to it. And I think the NFL does a really good job. Um, or they do their best with helping young players, especially um, to um, maneuver, being an adult, managing a budget. And I just think that we can keep, go keep going forward. Uh, we in the NFL have heard all the horror stories. You've seen the 30 for 30. Um, we know that you have to be smart with your money. And I think it's only going to get better. Now, Carl, if I could follow up there really quickly, I have this image in my mind from that HBO Hard Knock season, you and a whiteboard and a black marker trying to teach yep. some of your friends and teammates about the simple idea of compounding interest and compounding returns. Is it really that simple? What are the most important things that have been asked of you in your role as a teacher for some of your peers, friends and teammates out there in professional football? I mean, I like to think it's that simple. Uh, it's not about how much you make, it's about how, how much you save. And when you are a young individual with a good amount of money, the opportunity you have um, as an investor is huge. You can take on higher risk. You can invest in things that you might take losses on, but then have gains later on. So I, I honestly do think it's that simple. I think that um, having advisors is also a good idea. I just got my first advisor um, this past off season. Uh, investment wise, I've done a very good job. Um, as with every, everybody over the last four years, the economy has been incre incredible, but with tax management, I, I've missed out on some pretty, uh, important things. So it, it depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about just the concept of saving money, living below your means and, uh, preparing for the future, that part's simple. But I think that there are some other good things that you might need to, uh, have a, a good team for. All right. So, so Brandon, I've gone from the, the, the locker room and team offices and a whiteboard and a dry erase marker for Carl, teaching his teammates about that. You've kind of got a similar setup with a board, I'm sure, chalk or dry erase or otherwise, at the University of Pennsylvania, when you could actually hold in-person classes. These are formal classes at an Ivy League school. What exactly are students asking you, and what are the most important lessons you are teaching them? Yeah, I think the, the main thing on a lot of students' minds, besides their career and potential earnings post graduation is student loan debt, right? Um, 
their current living situations? Will it be able to afford their apartment? Uh, or, or how will they be able to afford their apartment uh, going out of college? So we try to really backtrack and first and foremost, get a lot of the students to understand what they're actually searching for and why money is important to them, right? Um, it's not like, a, it sounds like a, a, a rhetorical question sometimes, but when you think about a lot of the things that we are trying to buy, you know, I'll speak to it as an athlete, some things I don't even necessarily want, Brandon Copeland doesn't want, but I see my teammate with it or my neighbor with it. And so now I feel a little bit of pressure to keep up with the Joneses, right? when you have to understand that your situation and your goals, your vision for yourself years from now is not the same as your teammates or your neighbor, um, the, the, your coworker, your colleague, whatever it may be for your situation, you have to understand, okay, if I, my vision is a little bit different than theirs or I see a lot further than them, I have bigger goals for myself. Well, I cannot spend money or do or, or, or achieve those results acting the way that they do not saying that treating yourself is a bad thing, but you know, I know someone reached out to me yesterday cause they saw something that I did and they said, you know, Hey, you inspire me. I'm going to choose to live more frugal. And I just told them, Hey, you know, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Cause I get it. But a lot of things are, are, are mindset and perspective and, and some words have negative connotations to them when you think about frugal, you think a little bit negatively, oh, you're, you're living cheap. But if you think about it as I'm investing in myself, exactly what Carl just said, I'm saving for an older version of me. Carl and I, we're running down the field. We're taking on double teams. We're hurting our body right now. I just went through pec surgery. Well, I'm doing all that for a reason, and it's to pay a 50-year-old version of myself, a 59-and-a-half-year-old version of myself. It's not me living frugally or me living super cheaply. It's me investing in the most important investment in the world, and that's me. Now, that, that's a huge point to make here. And, 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 Carl, maybe I'll ask this of you first, and then, and then I'll kind of ask Brandon the same thing. We, we've heard many athletes take different strategies towards planning for their futures, some folks only, say, spend or, or use their signing bonuses and, and, and keep their annual salaries in savings. Some people do the opposite and only spend what they have in salary but keep their signing bonuses in a savings plan. What has been your strategy, Carl, with regard to how you kind of big picture manage your finances? What exactly do you spend? You guys both make seven-figure salaries. Um, for me, uh, I just haven't really changed as a person. Um, the things that bring me joy in life don't really come with a high price tag and that's never going to change. So I live the same life. I live, um, I have the same friends. Um, I just, it's, it's not, it's all the same money to me. I don't, I think that those are good things. Whatever works for anybody is as long as they're saving and not spent, you can enjoy your life. What Brandon just said, and you can treat yourself and, um, never like no day is guaranteed. So you should enjoy your life, but you should definitely prepare and invest in yourself. Um, I love what you said about investing in yourself. Um, I think that's awesome. And um, yeah. Now, Brandon, what exactly is your, in your big picture approach to managing things? Do you, do you save a certain amount? Do you, do you only spend a certain amount? How much do you actually go about putting away? How do you pay yourself? Yeah. It's funny that you asked that. Cause I'm, I want, I guess, everyone out there to understand that these things are ever evolving and there's always growth within these processes. So, you know, you'll see us up here or, or analysts talking about what they do and, and, and just understand that even though it looks like we have it all like figured out, we're still growing ourselves. So two years from now, we'll probably hopefully be better at what we're doing. And so I, I laugh when you said that because a few weeks ago, I realized that even though I'm similar to call, I have the same once I, you know, I, this is, this is my jewelry, you know, a, a 10 buck chain off of Amazon, uh, you know, things like that. I realized that I was lacking in setting and forgetting what was happening with my paycheck, so to speak. So um, I read a book called Automatic Millionaire, and it really encouraged me to take 
full on account of what is going on with my money. So for me, I try to live off of 6% of my income. And then the rest of the money is I'm saving some money now for another year in my life later down the road. I'm saving a little bit of my paycheck goes for a different year later on in my life. And then the rest of it is going towards some type of investments. Um, and all of them are ultimately being invested at some level, shape, form, or fashion, but the the different aggressiveness is dependent upon how quickly I may need access to the money. All right, so, so speaking of how quickly you need access to the money, managing around that money and the big ticket items that you have in anyone's life are big deals. I'd like to talk, Carl, to you about what your approach or your philosophy is with regard to the big ticket items for most of us Americans, and, and perhaps you included. That's for either your living arrangements and your auto arrangements. Are you a rent or an own type person? And when it comes to houses and cars, how exactly do you treat that idea? And what exactly are the, are the value constructs behind how you actually go about thinking, I want to buy that house or just rent it or buy that car or just rent it? Um, it's a great question. Uh, it depends on your situation. If you're a, if you want to be a home buyer, um, you should really have a 10 year plan. If you're only planning to live there for three years in a short period of time, you're really not going to build any equity, uh, in that house. All the, all the money you're paying back to the, wherever you got your mortgage is going to be mostly interest. Um, so if you can have a s smaller rent cost, then I think you should do that. Uh, when it comes to auto, when it comes to automobiles, um, again, it depends on your situation. Uh, I grew up with like the the worst cars; uh, they were always breaking down on me. Um, I in college, I bought a, a 2004 Ford Escape, like 200,000 miles on it. So for me, I I can't go back to that um, style of driving around that brings me too much anxiety. So. Um, I'll like having a new car that is very safe and very reliable is something that I'll, I, I have to have. Um, other than that, um, I think that having multiple cars, I see some people have multiple cars in various industries, not just the NFL. Um, I think that's uh, a little frivolous and I don't understand. You only drive one at a time as far as I, as far as I'm aware. Uh, but yeah, I think that, uh, depends on your situation when it comes to living, uh, just, uh, know what you're know what you're getting into in the long term because you can really have some regrets uh, down the line. You know, Brandon, I, I interviewed a number of years back former NL Cy Young winner R. A. Dickey, and I asked him what the first big ticket purchase he made was when he got his first big contract. You know what he told me? He said it was an iPhone. That's what they got. That's what they splurged on. What exactly did you splurge on when you first got that kind of big payday? Man, I'm again. Fortunately, I'm I'm lucky. I think you know Carl and I think similarly uh I've had a roller coaster ride of a career and I'm also fortunate to have seen my grandfather who played for 11 years as well um his life after football so for me I understood that it was not promised it was not guaranteed um I was driving the same car that I've been driving since high school for my first three years in the league and uh I literally probably did not make a major purchase at all you know to be quite honest with you. I think maybe it might've been some, some, some gift for my mom or something like that, but it, it, you know, to be quite, it probably was a Pandora bla bracelet or something like that. I'm not going to then <laughs> tell mom, she got to put in some work. She has to run down this field to get a little more than <laughs> that now. <laughs> recently, I guess, well, building on that recently though, after six years in the league, I did pay off her house. So I, I paid off her house and she had been paying on it for, for years. And it was a house um, we grew up in for a certain part of our, our childhood. So I paid that off and she was extremely happy about that. But that was probably the biggest uh, purchase. It's a big part of the American dream for all of us, paying off your homes. We've just got a couple minutes left here, guys. And I'd like to end with this question that I'm, I'm going to pose to each of you guys. Brandon, I will start with you first. What is the biggest company stock business story that's captivated your attention so far this year? Ooh, man, this, is, this has been an interesting year. I, I'd i say uh, a company that I'm continue, continually impressed by is Amazon. Um, 
yeah, I think they're literally just taking over the world. Clearly, they, they announced today that they're getting into the pharmaceutical business, right? Uh, Walgreens stock is down tremendously because of it. Um, I'm very interested in Tesla, um, but but I also uh, again, simply put, Amazon. I think it's it's it was built for the the new norm, this norm, uh, and it's just pretty amazing how they continue their as an athlete is very, very cool to see a business that is not happy with uh, or not complacent in its current situation or results. It's continually, it's continuously uh, evolving and growing and diving into new businesses. And, and for me, I personally am very, very intrigued by that. That's a great one. It's captivated a lot of investors out there. Carl, same question to you. What's the big business story or company or, or theme that you've been watching so far in 2020? Um, I can tell you the one I try not to look at, and that's Tesla, because I told myself uh, in the beginning of this year that if it ever got below $400, uh, I was going to invest. And it got below, right below $400, right when I was uh, negotiating my contract here in Las Vegas. So I was not paying attention to uh, the market or anything. And I, every time, you know, last couple months and it's, this entire year, it's exploded. So that's probably my biggest regret in uh I try not to look at uh, the daily um, ups and downs of the stock market too much. Um, but yeah, just that's my that's my one to try to avoid at least. All right. Amazon for Brandon and Tesla for Carl. Gentlemen, thank you guys very much for joining us today. We really appreciate your thoughts and insights. Hey, thanks, Don. Thanks, appreciate man. it. My name is Todd Baldwin, I'm 27 years old, I live in Seattle, Washington, and I make $615,000 per year. money through real estate investing. We bring in about $460,000 per year doing that and about $150,000 as profit and that is after living completely for free and all expenses are paid. We bought our first house at age 23. We are now 27 and we have $4.4 million worth of real estate. So my wife and I live completely for free by house hacking and having roommates. So we live in a brand new duplex and we have the other half of that duplex on Airbnb and we live in the main half. We also converted one of the garages into a studio apartment. We have that on Airbnb as well. And in our main unit, the, the half that we live in, we have roommates. So we rent out one bedroom for $1,200 and another bedroom for $850. After living in our duplex completely for free by renting out the other half, the downstairs garage, and the bedrooms on our side, we live completely for free, plus we make $1,850 in profit. I was raised by a single mom and I watched her struggle working four jobs to try to feed three kids. And she was worried all the time about money. Uh, and I saw it and I could feel it and it wasn't a good feeling. And from a very early age, um, about, about 12 years old, I told myself that that's not something that I wanted in my later years, it's not something that I wanted for my family. And I had to make a change and, and do something different. I started making money online when I was 15 and then I started investing at age 19, but I really just, through reading books, listening to podcasts, um, watching YouTube videos, I really just kind of had to figure it out and, and learn as I go. When I was 12 years old, I had the goal that I wanted to become a millionaire by the age of 30. And after working like crazy and investing and acquiring properties, our net worth crossed $1.2 million when we were 25 years old. I grew up in Washington State. I met my wife in college. Although our net worth is seven figures, we don't do a lot of the typical things that most people envision millionaires doing. We share one car, which is a 2009 Ford Focus. We are super frugal. 
and you know you're a real estate guy when you have four and a half million dollars of cash flowing rental properties, but you spent $12 on your wedding ring made completely out of rubber. We're just, we're very frugal. We're, we're not cheap, but we, you know, we, we would just rather spend money on things that also make us money. We don't really like spending money on expenses. We could probably actually retire now if we wanted to, but our goals are so much loftier than that. I want my 6,000 apartments by the age of 60. So I don't know if I'm ever the type of person to truly retire in the traditional sense. An interesting story that is uh, at, at such a young age to have worked so hard and the way they live uh, for nothing by uh, renting out their uh, apartments and various units there. Interesting story. We've got a poll on the right of your screen. There's a little tab there. It says poll. It's an eensy beensy uh, type. Uh, we just posted a new question asking if you consider yourself a spender or a saver. Tell us which one you are. I think right now I would say I'm probably more of a spender than a saver. Most of my savings is automatic, comes out of my paycheck, and I did a lot of savings uh, when I was younger. Best advice I ever got was from my father, and that was to live beneath your means. And so I hopefully am still doing that. Our next guest will reveal the reason behind your actions, why you do what you do with money. And she says it all boils down to behavior and psychology. Here now is Isha Sharma, an associate professor of business at Dartmouth. Dartmouth. She'll be interviewed by my colleague, Rahel Solomon. Isha, well, welcome and thanks for being with us. So you study behavioral psychology, essentially why we do the things that we do. And I think it's safe to say that most people would like to spend more. But why does it feel so difficult for some? Why can't we just spend, save more? Yeah, so there are a lot of reasons why saving money can be challenging for people. Some of those reasons relate to who people are as individuals. So one of the tendencies that uh, we've seen in research is the tightwad spendthrift tendency. And this really refers to what people get joy out of doing. There are some individuals who, when they receive money, they really get a lot of pleasure into you know, putting aside that money, saving every penny. And there are other individuals who get a lot of joy from spending. You know, as soon as you get a paycheck, thinking about all the things that you could spend your money on. So there's definitely a difference between individuals in terms of where you get your pleasure from putting aside money or save, or uh, spending money. And in addition to those, those differences, uh, in general, saving money isn't really a pleasurable activity compared to all of the joy that you could get from consumption. And so when you put aside money, it could feel like a loss. You feel like you're kind of depriving yourself from some consumption that you could enjoy. And so those are some of the reasons why that might happen. It's the difference between instant gratification or delayed gratification and instant gratification. I mean, at least personally, almost always feels better to me, but you know. Uh, so are, are those differences hardwired, for example, or, or are you just sort of conditioned differently? I mean, how do you, what determines whether someone gets real pleasure from saving versus spending? Yeah, so uh, some research points to people's childhood environments and the conditions under which they were brought up. So some of those things can really be shaped by the environments that you're in, either in childhood or adulthood. But uh, what we found in some of the research that I've done is that when you, when you wanna save money, you have to feel like you actually have the ability to save, that you actually have spare money to put aside. And what I've seen is that aside from your income and your assets and your material possessions, what really shapes how we feel about our money is perceptions that we have based on what you would like to consume, how much money you wish you had, and comparisons to your peers. So mm. regardless of your income bracket, a lot of people may feel financially constrained. Even millionaires can feel financially constrained. And when you have that perception, it may become especially difficult to save. And some research I found, I've actually seen that when you think about ways to improve your financial situation, you're especially likely to think about ways to increase your earnings rather than thinking about ways that you could cut back or put aside money. And Isha, to that point, I think there is a feeling amongst many that 
in order to save more, you just need to earn a little bit more. And so it's sort of put off. But how important is um, saving more aggressively versus earning more? Yeah, that's a really great question. And if you ask people, you know, how much money do I need to be financially secure? A lot of people will say, well, just a little bit more. And the danger there is that both are, are very important to improving your financial situation. And what people might not consider is that when you are finding ways to earn more money, they often come with costs, sometimes increased education or transportation, you know, work clothing. And there are a lot of ways that you could save that don't necessarily require cutting back on desired consumption. You might think about you know, automatically renewing magazine subscriptions or apps on your iPhone. And there are a lot of different ways that you can think about saving that don't require sort of depriving yourself of what you want. So what I would say is that both of them are important, but one of them tends to be more overlooked than others. And perhaps part of the reason is that a lot of times when people think about saving, they think about saving a large amount of money or they think about saving for retirement. And that feels like something that may need to come later or, or could come later. But saving early and often is, is never a bad thing if that's something that you can afford to do. And research has actually shown that if you think about savings in smaller increments, like saving $5 a day rather than $150 a month, that can actually be a helpful way to sort of break that down into a smaller, more manageable piece for people. Is it more effective to have a savings goal tied to savings? So instead of an abstract, I need to save more because financial gurus tell me to save more, or is it more effective to perhaps uh, have a savings goal tied to a specific goal. I want to own a home in five years. Um, I'd like to retire when I'm 50, et cetera, et cetera. Or is it just, you know, saving is saving is saving? Yeah. So I would love to say that saving is saving is saving, but it really does help to have concrete, specific goals. Uh, so like you said, you know, this is my, my, the, the pot of cash that I'm putting aside for a home, or this is a pot of cash that I'm putting aside even for, you know, a nice dinner or a vacation, having something concrete and tangible will make it easier for you to put aside money. And another trick that you could think about doing is something called temptation bundling. So, you know, anytime I want to treat myself and watch the Queen's Gambit, I will, you know, make sure that I put aside money. Uh, every time I transfer money um, consciously, I will, you know, treat myself to a milkshake, something like that. Yeah, that, that's effective. Another part of the equation that we have to talk about when we're talking about saving is debt, right? So uh, one out of 11 people with credit card debt say that they feel like they'll never be able to get out of credit card debt. Um, and we do know, of course, that some people borrow out of basic necessity because maybe they've fallen on hard times. But 32% uh, of people say that discretionary spending is actually the number one reason for their credit card debt. So why is it that we feel like when perhaps we can't pay in cash or it's not available in our checking account, that credit cards will do? Yeah, I think that's a really fascinating question. And it's one that my co-authors and I have been studying for many years. And one thing to note is that consumer borrowing is on the rise. And it seems like every day we're sort of flooded with all of these messages, with new credit card offers, with tempting rewards. And there are just so many ways for us to finance our discretionary purchases. And my co-authors and I were really interested in some of the factors that increase people's willingness to borrow. And what's really interesting about using borrowed money is that this is money that doesn't belong to you, right? This is money that you're going to have to repay at some point. But what we found is that consumers actually feel that borrowed money is like their own money. So instead of feeling like a loan or an obligation that they have to repay, some individuals truly feel that using borrowed money is like using their own cash. And what's really interesting about this is that money in the form of credit card tends to be higher in this perception, which we call psychological ownership of borrowed money. So when I use a credit card, 
psychologically, it feels more like I'm using my own money than if I'm going to borrow using a loan, for example. And this can be particularly dangerous because borrowing using a credit card, that tends to have higher interest rates and can you know, potentially lead to excessive borrowing and potentially uh, less concern about repaying if people think that this is like their own money. Yeah, and I do, I do want to circle back to perhaps the, the reason why we use credit cards for discretionary spending. I've seen in some literature that, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's a search for happiness, and aren't we all searching for happiness? Um, and, and so speak a little bit about the emotions tied, whether consciously or unconsciously, to spending uh, dis, you know, on discretionary purposes or for possessions or even experiences, really, uh, on credit cards when you don't have it um, readily available to you in your checking account. Sure. So when you are deciding whether to borrow for a purchase, what you're doing is making a trade off. You know, if you if you want to buy an outdoor grill and you don't have the cash to do it, what you're going to be thinking about is whether I can forego that consumption or whether that purchase is so desirable to me that I will borrow to make that purchase. And, you know, you're talking about the pleasure that you get from purchases. What my co-authors and I have found is that people are actually more willing to go into debt for things that are more experiential in nature than things that are more material in nature. So, for example, with the, the outdoor grill example, uh, we ran a study where we had the same outdoor grill and we talked about it as your 4th of July grill. You know, imagine what you're going to do with it and who's going to be there. You're using this for a, a very specific event. Or we talked about it as a possession that you would own and have, ask people to think about where you would put it. And what we found is that that same possession was felt more attractive for people to borrow for when it was talked about as an experiential purchase. Now, what this mm -hmm. means is the more you think about you know, the, the people, the, the things that you're going to do, the more you conceptualize it as an event, it becomes more and more difficult to forego that consumption to, or even to delay it. So people may be mm -hmm. more willing to borrow to get that enjoyment from something that has been, you know, conceptualized in that manner. It feels less substitutable. It seems more unique. And Isha, that's an, an interesting point about experiential um, purchases versus um, possessions, because we've even seen, I think, some retailers start to employ that to get consumers to buy into a brand. You're not buying a pair of leggings, for example. You're buying into an entire Lululemon brand, for example, or Nike or, or whatever it may be. Um, let's talk about some specific concrete examples for people watching, although this has been very insightful. We want it to be practical as well. For people watching who want to save more, um, where do you start? Sure. So uh, I think it's always a good idea to sort of think about your financial situation as a whole and to think about what you are able to save. And so if you are in a situation where you're able to save money, um, we talked about some of the things that might be useful. For example, you know, setting these concrete, specific goals that you have for yourself or tying what your savings are to a specific purchase. Another thing is breaking down those savings into a smaller, more manageable piece, such as $5 daily, rather than thinking about the big chunk of money that you have to put aside from your paycheck or a larger amount that you need to put aside per year. Another thing that has been really helpful for people is to sort of pre-commit to saving. So if you have your paycheck, you may immediately think about an expense that you want to pay for, something you want to do to treat yourself. Uh, if you pre-commit to saving, so you know automatically allocate a certain percentage of your paycheck to go to a savings account, that might be easier for you to do than if you're making a decision on the spot. These automated savings can also be really helpful. There are certain apps and, and even uh, rules that you can set up on your bank account that will automatically, uh, you know, transfer certain amounts of money to a savings account, which can also be really helpful for people. There are more ways to spend than ever, but there are also more ways to save than ever as well. Isha, we do have to wrap it up um, very shortly, but I, I just wanted to ask one final question very quickly. You know, you hear uh, two different schools of thought from financial gurus about whether 
you should pay off all of your debt first before you save, or if you should at the very least have an emergency fund um, before you pay off your debt. Where do you stand on that? Yeah, so I think that's a really interesting question. And what I would encourage consumers to do is to really think about the rate of return or the interest rates that they are, are facing. Uh, in some very early works, my collaborators and I have been looking at how individuals may feel like they need to repay their debt before they could save or invest money. But a lot of times, depending on you know your, your risk tolerance and things like that, there are a lot of situations where you can actually make more money if you invest your money. Uh, you know, for example, if you expect a six or seven percent return on an investment, and you know your mortgage payment or your your mortgage has a three percent interest rate, you may actually be better off putting aside some money or investing money rather than repaying that debt. So I don't think there's a hard and fast rule about which one you should do uh, across the board. But I do think that considering your financial ability as well as the interest rates and rate of returns that are available on these products is a really useful thing to take into account when you're making that decision. Right. Not, not a one size fits all. Uh, Isha Sharma, we'll have to leave it there. It was a great discussion. We so appreciate you being with us. Thank you. Uh, the best financial advice, don't go into baseball. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, actually, you know, here's the best uh, piece of advice. Start your 401k early, as soon as you can. Um, that was the best piece because I've seen it grow and blossom. And, um, you know, no matter how little you're putting in, you're still putting in something. That is good advice. When I was working years ago for Time Incorporated, I had a mentor there. And we had two funds in our 401k, or what was called then profit sharing. Fund A, which was largely stocks, and Fund B, which was largely fixed income. And he said, put everything you've got into Fund A. Bang. He was right. Well, making money decisions can be overwhelming, particularly during these uncertain times. That's why we've called in two experts to answer your questions. So keep posting them in the chat over here on the right-hand side of your screen. Tiffany Aliche is the founder of The Budget Nista. And Winnie Sun is managing partner at Sun Wealth Group. And back with us is Sharon Epperson, CNBC's senior personal finance correspondent. Sharon. Thank you, Tyler. I remember that fun day. I did the same thing and put all my money in that 401k that I could and started early on. And it's that discipline that's kept me going. You know, that's what we're going to talk about. A lot of this tips and strategies and money hacks that you want to know to help you better your, manage your money is what we're going to talk about right now. Many people are struggling to get by financially. Some are just trying to stay afloat. Others, since they're not traveling, they're not going out as much, they do actually find that they have more money to save. And they want to make sure that they're making the most of that money. And that's why we have Tiffany and Winnie here to help us figure this all out and make the most of what we have right now. Thank you so much, Tiffany Aliche and Winnie Sun for being here with us to talk about money hacks and a lot of other questions that folks have to ask you. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much for having us. I wanted, I wanted to first start by asking both of you about your favorite money hack. I wanted to find out what's the one positive step that you think everyone should be taking right now with their money during this pandemic that could actually wind up making a big difference in their finances? Winnie, let's start with you. I love this question. So I think I would say is to focus on where your income is coming from. And, and this is something that I'm a big believer on because you know there's a saying in the financial industry that money is like a bar of soap. Um, and the more you rub it, the smaller it gets. And my motto has always been <laughs> that we should collect more soap. And, and so I think we should focus on ways that we can bring in income, however small, however different ways we can do it. And my money Tiffany, hack. What's your favorite money hack? So mine is to think about budgets differently. I think a lot of people are, um, they are opposed to budgets because they see it as something that's there to tell you no. But I say your budget is your say yes plan, but it's more like yes if. 
Can I go on vacation? Yes, if you start saving. Can I, you know, get that coat that I want? Yes, if you save in this this other part of your life. And so the money hack for me is to to shift your mindset that your budget is not there to tell you no. Indeed, your budget is your say yes plan, but oftentimes it's it's yes if. I like that. I like that a lot. I want to get to some of the many questions that have come in for both of you. And Winnie, here's one that Mel wants to know. Hi, I'm Mel Whiteside from Wichita, Kansas. My question is, with today's current financial environment, what investment recommendations do you have for a couple in their mid-50s who plan to retire within the next 10 years? Thank you. Winnie, what do you say? So Mel, great question. I love the question. You're in your 50s, you're looking to retire in 10 years. The area that I would look is number one, we're gonna we're gonna assume that you don't have any debt. You know, if you don't have any debt, credit card debt, whatnot, maybe you have a mortgage. I would take a look at other ways to invest in something that's tax deferred. So if you've already maximized your 401k, which I hope you did, um, then you could take a look at pairing that up with an IRA or a Roth IRA, depending on how much. Uh, you and your wife earn. So I would say really focus on tax sheltered investing right now because we do know taxes are going to be going higher. So that's going to be your uh, best strategy in terms of tax deferral investing. Then what you invest in it uh, for the next 10 years is a conversation you should actually have with a professional to, to really assess your time horizon and your risk tolerance to make sure that you work with a professional as you go into retirement. Really not a good idea right now to do it yourself. Yeah. No, Tiffany, how would your advice change if you're a bit younger? If you're in your 30s or your 40s, what investment recommendation would you give? No, certainly you should you should be maxing out your 401k, especially if your 401k offers a match, which is when your company says if you put in a certain amount of income or put in any part of your income that they too will either match you dollar for dollar or partially dollar for dollar. So certainly starting there. But when you're younger, you can take more risks. So that means that you would likely have more of your income in, in investments like stocks because there is a bigger reward, although there are bigger risks. But because you're younger, you can ride that wave. Whereas you get closer and closer to retirement, you're wanting to be invested in things that are a little bit more conservative, like potentially bonds because or or just even cash investments if you're if you're retiring retiring right away so just the closer you get to retirement the more conservative you want your investments to be excellent what do you think by the way tiffany of what's known as a target date fund something that automatically will get more conservative um as i you get love closer those to your retirement date so here's the thing. You can be your you can create your own target date fund if you don't mind doing the work yourself. You can literally use your birthday as the day to say um that this is so the the rule of thumb is you take your your age in bonds. So I am 40 years old, so 60% um, percent of my investments would look like stocks and 40% in bonds. And if I was 80, 80% 80 in bonds and 20% and in stocks, meaning the older you are, the more conservative your investments look. But not everybody wants to do that. So a target date fund, you know, there are definitely fees involved because someone has to do the manipulating for you. But a target date fund will actually rebalance your portfolio for you. Will, as you get older, make your 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 investments more and more conservative. If you're someone who's a like, kind of wants to just set it and forget it. Excellent, excellent. I have another question from Angela, um, and she's asking. She's saying that she struggles with setting a realistic goal, and she wants to know how do you set personal goals for your money. And I want to give this to you, Tiffany, first, because your group, Dreamcatchers, is all about setting goals and reaching those goals. How do you get started? Well, you start with really not the money itself, because money is a tool like a hammer. You can use money to build your financial house. That same hammer can be used to destroy your financial house. And so if you focus on the money, um, I don't think it's going to be easy to stick to your goal. So instead, you, you focus on the, the desired outcome. I would like to own a home for security, or I would like to own a home because I want my child to grow up in a home. And what does that look like? And then working backwards. Okay, what, what do I need in order to own a home? I know that there's like, I'll likely have to put down a down payment. How much would that be? Um, there are potentially closing costs. What would that cost? But not just that, you also wanna put other things in place. Do I need a realtor? 
Do I need an attorney? So starting to gather not just the financial aspects of what your goals are going to require, but the total aspects and, and working backwards. And then you can have a clear goal and task list where you can start to check things off and where money is applicable, you add it. And when it's not, it's not. Some, I think we think that money sometimes is the end all be all, but oftentimes some of the things that we're needing is, is research or access or knowledge. It's it's not always money. So setting a goal by this, creating your desired outcome and then working toward that steadily. Winnie, how do you set goals with your clients? How do you help them achieve their goals from the outset? Well, Sharon, I think, you know, putting together, uh, like I, I agree with Tiffany completely. I think the first thing you want to do is start with a, a, a just a clean piece of paper and a pen or pencil and start writing the things that ideally you would love to achieve. And that sort of is your goal map. And then from there, make it simpler. So I always say pick three goals. I'll have my clients pick two more serious goals and one like a fun goal. So the fun goal could be, you know, taking the family to Hawaii. And the serious goals could be reaching retirement or making sure my son goes to college, whatever that may be. And then the other thing you want to do is then once you have that, figure out what it takes to reach that goal. Like Tiffany said, you want to know what the end goal is, but then also make it easy. So title your accounts with the names of your goals and then set up automatic savings so that the, your goals get funded every time you get paid or you have income money coming into your checking account. Make it so you are the gatekeeper to your financial success. The more you can automate your, your savings, the better. And then become a collector of money. And, and that's the thing is a lot of times we collect a whole bunch of things. And, you know, I always tell my clients, if you can start thinking that collecting money means that I'm going to be able to reach my financial goals sooner, it changes it, it shifts it to a very positive discussion. I love that idea, collecting money, love it. Winnie, there's another question here for you from LA. Hello, my name is Bharati from Los Angeles, California. And my question is, how much pre-tax 401k contribution should we be making beyond the company match point? And is Roth IRA contribution beyond that point recommended over 401k contribution? Thanks. That is you know, Winnie, a, a lot of folks may not realize that they have access to a Roth 401k or a regular 401k. Can you talk a little bit about the difference and what sure. this person may want yeah. to do right now with their 401k money? Absolutely, Sharon. That's actually what I was going to mention, too. You should actually look at your workplace and see if you're offered a Roth 401k. It's an awesome way to be able to set aside money on a, you know, a, a very tax um, preferred way of managing your money. Now, the biggest difference between a regular 401k and a Roth 401k is when do you want to pay Uncle Sam? Do you want to pay taxes on the beginning or at the end? Now, in most cases, if you've got at least 10 plus years to retirement, the Roth 401k in my book is like the golden egg because that means that I'm paying taxes on what I contribute. So let's say I put in $1,000. I pay taxes on the $1,000 and I leave that money in the Roth 401k until I get older at 59 and a half, age 59 and a half and beyond, it's 100% mine, which is really powerful because we do know that this year in 2020, taxes in many cases are actually kind of on sale. Taxes are reasonable this year. Going mm -hmm. forward, given how much we've spent with uh, the CARES Act and with COVID relief and whatnot, taxes are going to be going higher. And therefore, I would love to be able to have a defined amount of what I owe in taxes. And so in the future, whatever is mine, whatever grows, grows to be 100% tax-free. So absolutely, I would take a look at that. And if you've already maximized your 401k, then absolutely that next power move is to also fund that IRA as well. Excellent. Excellent advice. Tiffany, um, Susie has this question. She wants to know, how do you go about finding an honest financial advisor? Now, as a personal finance educator, what are you teaching people to do? What steps should they be taking to make sure that they're finding a reputable financial advisor? So this is something, Sharon, that I struggled with for a number of years as well. Not, not an honest one, but one that was a fit. So what you're looking for is someone that you can trust because this is someone who's going to be looking at the ins and outs of your money. I started with personal referrals. So you might think to yourself, I don't know anyone that 
that has, you know, a financial advisor, honestly, I posted on my Facebook page. I said, does anybody have an amazing financial advisor that they like? I got a list. I am in part of a number of financial groups. I posted that anybody have a reputable financial advisor. I made a list. And then I looked those financial advisors up. And what you're really looking for is a certified financial planner because financial advisor is a broad term that you can use for almost anyone. But a certified financial planner means that this person has worked um, in the field for, I think it's at least two years, and that they have um, passed um, um, certain um, uh, tests to make sure that they know what they're doing. Because you want to make sure that the person that you're hiring is not just somebody who just started yesterday or has just given them that themselves that name, uh, financial advisor. So certified financial planner. And then once you have that, you also too want to, this is like your doctor. Do you feel comfortable sharing your financial information with them? Do you feel like they're on the same page as you? Do you feel pressured when you're working with them? Also, what I like about a, a certified financial planner is that there are multiple ways to pay a certified financial planner. You can pay out of pocket like I do. Um, oftentimes financial planners, some of them might sell you products and services and they get paid off of that. I like to not mix the both. That instead, I, I like to just pay for the advice. I don't want someone selling me products and services and then being paid from that because I want to make sure that the advice that I'm getting is not tainted by some back-end money that they're receiving. So keeping that um, in mind as well. So asking around, vetting through once you do ask, finding yourself a certified financial planner and asking how do they get paid and make sure you're comfortable with that. You know, Winnie, a lot of people around now may be thinking about firing the financial advisor that they did have or look around for someone else because they're not sure if they were getting the best advice. As a certified financial planner, and you are one, Winnie, what are people missing when they come to you? When they come to you, they may have had some missteps. What do you think some of the missteps are that people make with financial advisors that you're hoping that they don't make and that they won't make if they're with you, perhaps? So we have, uh, Sharon, exactly. We've had a lot of clients come to us this year, especially with the pandemic. And oftentimes they'll say, I've been with you know this many financial advisors and they, they didn't hear me. I felt like I was telling them this and I told them this again. And it, it wasn't just performance, but it was really the experience that they had. They felt like um, they weren't being heard, that their concerns weren't being heard, and things just weren't being made right. And I think when you're looking to establish a relationship with an advisor, um, that's sort of the key thing is do they speak your language? And are they talking, if, if you're in a partnership, are they talking to both partners? Um, and do they understand where you're coming from? And I, I love what Tiffany said. One thing I will definitely emphasize on is the, the level of experience. Right now, especially since we're in a pandemic and beyond, you're looking for a financial advisor who has been in the business at least over a decade. And why I think that's important is because the last um, downfall of financial markets was, you know, in the in the last dec uh, over over eight nine years ago. So if you find a financial advisor that's only been in business for like the last four or five years or even less, they haven't really managed money during a downturn, and that's critical. So we're having discussions with our clients right now. They value experience, but more importantly, they're looking for a partnership and a friend that they can talk money with and who's not going to judge them and who they can see growing old with. And that's the key with a financial advisor. Unlike a lot of your relationships, it's not transactional. You're building a friendship and a partnership just like you would a physician uh, or your, your trusted doctor. This is a long-term thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have another question from Mary, who actually wanted to pose this question to both of you. Let's hear what she had to say. Hello, my name is Mary Liz Burns from Washington, D.C. And my question is, so many women have lost their jobs or become underemployed during this pandemic. We can't even think about our financial future when everything is right here and right now. How can we address women's long-term financial needs without introducing more shame and guilt about just dealing with today? Thank you. Tiffany, let me start great. with you on that one. What are your thoughts? 
Mary, I, I've been there. The last, the 2008, 2009, 2010 recession found me in that position. I was a school teacher for 10 years. My school suddenly closed because it lost its funding. It was a nonprofit based school. So all of a sudden I, I had a, a home that I could no longer afford. I had no job, no income. I had spent all of my savings, including withdrawing money from my retirement account to try to save my home and only to be met with foreclosure. I was in dire straits. I say that I was, and I was 30, I wasn't 21, 22. And I remember thinking at that time that I had less money at 30 than I did when I was 16 and I used to babysit. So it was a really dark time. And I wish I would have known what I know now is that I am more important than my debt. I withdrew all of my savings, all of my retirement. I tried desperately to try to keep up instead of keeping up with myself. And then I wish I would have given myself permission to say, Tiffany, if you don't have food to eat and you don't have a place to stay, that is your priority. Everyone can literally wait that you now have to drop down to what I call your health and safety budget. That is when you look at your expenses and ask yourself, do I need to pay this thing in order to maintain my health? Do I need to pay this thing in order to maintain my safety? And if not, it will have to wait. Because what happened anyway was I lost everything anyway. My credit score bombed. Everything fell apart. Um, and now here I am. My credit score is back in the 800s, and I'm back strong again. I just wish I would not have put myself through that. So, Mary, I would say giving yourself permission to make other people wait. Now, you pick up the phone and, and you call, but and, and letting folks know that you, you might not have um, the money to pay right now. But... Everything else can wait except for your 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 health and, and safety. I just I cannot stress that enough that that not making debt more important than where you currently are now. And eventually things do get better, but until they do, take care of yourself first and foremost. Absolutely, absolutely. Winnie, what would you say? What should women be doing right now? Well, Sharon and, and Tiffany, I agree with you, and I, I, my heart goes out to you. My mom told me something a long time ago, and she says. She told me the most important things in life are the things that money cannot buy. And this is so true. However, that being said, obviously we need money because money helps us get from point A to point B. I would say sometimes, you know, when we're looking at this and we're looking at our debt, we're looking at maybe empty accounts, we get so overwhelmed. And the good news is that there's definitely people out there that can help you through this. Sometimes we're looking at this huge mountain and we don't know where to start. It could be small steps, right? You're looking at and thinking, where am I going to, where am I going to find work? Where, what, what's, what, what is this going to, how am I going to make it through this next, you know, six months to next year? And you got to just take one step at a time. Every day, I would suggest reading a little bit more about personal finance, looking for an opportunity, going on social media, making a friend. Um, connecting with someone, putting yourself out there, looking for an opportunity for that day. It could be as simple as going through the house. Sometimes on like, uh, the weekends, I just love to vacuum. And what's nice about vacuuming is it's very, um, as you know, stress relieving, but also you find things you don't really need. So figure out step by step. It's like, I always tell my kids, it's like building a Lego wall, right? One step at a time. So one day I feel good. Let me sell some stuff. Second day I feel better. Let me go and call someone who might need um, my help and my expertise and might hire me. And you just build from there instead of thinking that this is big, scary monster of, you know, financial insecurity, take it step by step. And then most importantly, find a money buddy, find someone that you can talk money with your concerns, your questions. And I also recommend during this time, you know, financial advisors like myself, accountants, we're all like working from home and we actually have the time to set up a Zoom call or a call and just talk through some scenarios. You're not going to be here forever because you're already thinking that you want to get out of this. So, you know, we got to stay positive and get you through this. And the good news is you don't have to do it alone. Well, I know a lot of people are so excited to have two expert money buddies with them right now to answer questions. And we have a lot of questions that have been coming in during the chat. I want to get one to one of them right now from Deirdre, who asked a really important question, which is, what are some good money hacks for those struggling with job loss right now? So are there any quick fixes? Are there any money hacks that if you're struggling with job loss, you should be taking right now? Tiffany? Absolutely. Yeah. So one, what I would say is that during times like this, more entrepreneurs are made than ever before. 
And I am a big proponent of groups. So like Facebook groups, um, community groups, join as many as you can. I'm in one in particular that where it's filled with uh, women entrepreneurs and a day doesn't go by. I don't even know if an hour doesn't go by that someone doesn't say, does somebody know a designer? I'm looking for an admin. I'm looking to hire dot, dot, dot. There are people who are hiring and oftentimes it's, there are there are entrepreneurs, whether new or established. So joining um, entrepreneur groups and asking yourself, is there a skill set that you can monetize to be of support to people like that? Because during times of recession, more entrepreneurs are, are made than, than ever before. So if you're suffering job loss, tap into your inner skill set and see how you can monetize it. That's a great one. Winnie, what would you suggest? I totally love that, Tiffany. I agree with you. I would also suggest spending a little time beefing up your LinkedIn profile right now. And that means like, you know, your LinkedIn profile is your online resume. I would want you to beef up, put a new picture, a nice and fresh picture with your smartphone. You know, you can record your voice and, and say a little message so people can hear from you. And then what you want to do is make sure that your profile looks so attractive that if you extend an invitation to somebody, there's a 50% or better chance that they're going to say, yes, I do want to be a connection with you. Then I would jump on social media and I call it the breakfast, lunch, and dinner formula. So before the kids get out of bed, I actually spend 15 minutes on social, lunchtime, 15 minutes. And then when the kids go down or at dinner time, whatever that may be for you, 15 more minutes, go on social and actually engage with people that could potentially be a good connection for you and share your insight. 15 minutes a day, write about what your expertise is, what you're interested in, and you'll get noticed because people on LinkedIn are generally looking for business connections. And like Tiffany said, go on social media, work your network, but don't overlook areas such as Craigslist or even Facebook ads. Like I can't tell you how many people I've actually hired through Craigslist, the most amazing people. So don't discount the fact that there's people out there actually looking for help. And don't forget, it doesn't have to be the perfect job. It just needs to be something that you feel good about and that can bring you an income. Yep, yeah, that's a really good one too, Winnie. I want to get to a question um, that's come in about student loans. And there are a lot of folks struggling right now with student loan debt. Um, S. Payne asks, if I have $5,000 to use, would it be best to pay off one student loan, put it towards a car, or spread it between two debts? Or do you recommend keeping the extra cash flow? Yes, I do have an emergency savings. So that's good news. Tell me what do you say. Right. So I was literally going to say, but wait, do you have emergency savings? So great. You have emergency <laughs> savings. You want to make sure so you know awesome. that. Yep. Yes. So honestly, I mean... Logically, you should put excess money when you're that you don't need for savings toward your most expensive debt. So that is the debt with the highest interest rate. So um, I, I'm not sure how certain how badly you need that car, but if your student loans typically have lower interest rates, so if you have credit card debt, definitely wanting to to put um, money toward that to get rid of that because because of the interest rate, that debt is costing you more money to have than other debt. So I would say that. Now some people are a little bit more emotional and meaning that, and, and most of us are, but if you had a debt that that $5,000 would also totally wipe away and it would make you feel better and give you the energy you needed to go even harder to pay off more debt, then I'm not opposed to doing that too, even if the interest rate on that debt um, is not as high as some of your other interest rates. So first and foremost, get rid of your credit card debt. Second, um, is there something you could wipe out completely to make yourself feel better? Um, and third, yes, I mean, student loan debt, Typically, like I said, it's not very expensive. So that's always the last thing on my list to, to go hard for. And we don't know what this current administration is going to do for student loan debt. So I'm also like, let's wait and see before I go too hard with paying everything off. Yeah, that's a good point. Winnie, any final thoughts on debt, debt versus savings? A lot of people struggling with which one they should attack first. Well, first, I was going to ask you, do you really need that car right now in a pandemic? No, I'm kidding. But but in all seriousness, I agree with Tiffany. I actually like to tackle debt with the highest interest rate as well. I don't think you should split it. I would pay off the highest interest rate. If it's student debt, you know, I kind of think that somewhat it could be healthy debt. Plus, like as Tiffany mentioned, I mean, there's been talk that, that our next president could wipe out either between ten to 50000 with the student debt. Who knows if that'll happen? But I, I do think that the, the, the key thing here is to really take a look at that new that car that you're looking at. I want to make sure that, number one, I would 
I would challenge you not to buy a new car. I think that's, I've actually never bought a new car and, you know, I have four companies, but I think that that's really key is to figure out how you can keep your expenses low so you don't get yourself in a debt. And as Tiffany mentioned before, I love this. You got to do something that makes you feel good, right? And trust me, when you buy a car, it might feel good in the beginning, but then it can uh, soon become a financial burden. So we don't want that either. So maybe you do a little bit of both. You pay off a little bit more of your student debt, and then you buy a car maybe that's a little less expensive than what you had originally earmarked for. And I have a feeling that six or six months or a year from now, you won't regret, regret that decision. Excellent. I feel good moments. I think we need to end there. We need to have some feel good moments when it comes to our money. So Tiffany, I want to ask you for your final thought. What's the feel good moment that you experience when it comes to your money, especially right now? So the feel good moment that, that was huge for me is the last recession found me moving back home at age 30 to my middle school bed feeling like, wow, I really messed up. No savings, no retirement, no home. And, you know, back home with my parents, which was great fun. <laughs> Feel good moment is now this, the current recession that, that we experience, it is completely different. My home that I live in now is paid off with cash. I have a rental property that's also paid off. Um, I cannot lose my job because I am my job. I, I am self-employed. It's just like Wendy, I have four companies of my own. So 10 years later, you know, I told myself I would never be back in that position again. And not only am I not back in that position again, I have taken over 1 million women with me. Uh, we call ourselves dream catchers and they follow the budget Nista and we collectively work together to live richer lives. Yeah. And I know Winnie, your feel good moment is actually vacuuming and coming up with a plan for what to do with your money. Well, of course. Well, okay, I'll tell you. My feel-good moment is actually uh, right now because here I am with Sharon Epperson, with Tiffany and Bachanista, and we're having a really open dialogue about money. Like, how powerful is that? And there's diversity and there's inclusion, and we're not judging each other, and we're able to talk money. I mean, this is a big moment for all of us, and I think that's something that we need to embrace. We need to do more of that and not feel like we're being judged and feel comfortable and confident that we're being embraced and that things are going to get better. And that's the key thing. Things are definitely going to get better, especially after you, you hang out with us today, because, you know, we're talking money. And I'm hoping that you caught something today that you'll be able to implement and use for yourself. And then maybe that will trigger, you know, more wealth down the future. Exactly. We need to embrace this moment. We need to embrace one another. I'm giving you all a virtual hug. I love being with you ladies. Tiffany, Winnie, thank you so much for this real talk about money. We do need to do it more often and we're going to keep doing it. Follow us on social media. You'll hear a lot more. Tyler, I'll send it back over to you. Well, Sharon, stick around for just a minute because that was a wonderful conversation with two, no, three really accomplished women who know their stuff. Uh, you know, we began with your interview of Susie Orman, and one of the great lines of all time was, don't marry a financial loser. And then I can't help but think that, and nope. if you do, go vacuum, because there you'll get better ideas right. if you do. But at any rate, I, I find I work with a financial advisor, and I think there are a couple of things that you hit on there that are really important. One is know how they get paid uh, and know whether, whether you're going to pay them a fee for service, whether you're going to pay them a, a, a percentage of assets that they have under management and that you're comfortable with that. Find out all the ways they get paid so that at least you can set your heart uh, free that they're not doing things out of their own financial self-interest, which leads us to that question of, should your financial advisor be a fiduciary, meaning that they put the client's interests yes. ahead of their own? What do you think about that? And the key way to figure that out, Tyler, is to make sure they listen. Make sure they listen to what your goals really are and what your experiences are and the experiences that you want to have. The listening part is really key. If they're just telling you what to do, telling you what to do, and not hearing what you're saying, that's a problem. I think the other thing that I've found um, in my own life is th there are lots of good intentions on both sides of the relationship when the relationship between you and the financial advisor is beginning. They will be in touch with you a lot. They'll set up the meetings. They'll go through a planning process. But then things tend to melt a little bit, and it becomes a little more work to get together. I become lazy. Maybe they become uh, not as attentive as they should be. So it really talked to me about that idea that you really have to keep working at that relationship 
with your financial advisor. You have to keep you absolutely have to keep working at it. And, and it should be an a relationship where you feel that your calls are welcome, that your questions are received well and that are, they're answered fully. And I, I speak to my financial advisor constantly. And being in this business, covering what we're covering, sometimes it's hard to filter out the noise and focus on my own goals. I remember when I was covering commodities, there was a time when I just knew I needed to buy as much silver as possible because that particular week, silver looked like it was going to be on a tear and I really needed it. It didn't fit into my financial plan, my financial life in any way, but I'm on a trading floor with a bunch of traders that are telling me where it's going and I thought I need to have it. It was the financial advisor saying, wait a minute, you know, you don't necessarily, you have a 529 plan for your children. You don't need to buy them silver for their college days. There's yeah. another way that we can do this. And listening and hearing that, but being able to filter out the noise, whatever that might be, um, and, list, and being able to hear what the financial ha advisor has to say, but having a dialogue about it is really, really critical. The other thing is to make sure that, last... as Winnie and Tiffany mentioned, it's a team approach, right? It's not just one person that's telling you what to do with your money, but it may be one person who's then suggesting an accountant or working with one that you already have that you like, someone who's suggesting an attorney, someone who's going to help you put your uh, documents in place, that those key documents that Susie talked about that you need, your trust, your will, your living will or advanced directive, as well as your powers of attorney. So all of those things, you know, may not be done by one person, but having one person, you're the one who's really the CEO of your financial life. You're the one who's going to determine who's going to be on your team. But you want to make sure you have the right players there and your financial advisor can help you set that up. Yeah, no, and really a good reminder there is you need those documents handy when you need them, like a directive, a medical directive, Absolutely. things like that. If I'm... If I've got the medical directive and I'm in New Jersey and my aunt for whom I'm the, uh, the caretaker is in D.C., it doesn't do you any good if the emergency uh, call comes, if that document is not there for them to look at. The last piece of advice for the day, Sharon, is uh, for people to go and buy that book called The Big Payoff that's on your shelf right behind you there. <laughs> it's uh, by an author I know. She's really, really good. Yes. Sharon Epperson, thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tyler. <laughs> You, you bet, my friend. All right, many thanks to uh, all of our guests today, and thanks to you all for joining us this afternoon. Hopefully you uh, have walked away with some useful tips, some knowledge about money, uh, uh, the psychology of money and what it stands for and what it can bring you. For additional content and to watch today's sessions once again, you can visit our website. And I want to thank our sponsors. They would be Empower Retirement and Fully. And for more about our sponsors, you can click on the Expo icon on the left of your screen. Please uh, consider joining us uh, December 3rd for a live stream focusing on transforming media. That is part of what we call our Evolve series. And you can always learn more about all of our events at CNBCEvents.com. And for all of us here at CNBC and the events team at CNBC, we thank you for joining us. And again, have a good, no, a great rest of your day. Thanks a lot.